As soon as they passed, my father called us into the dining room, set us down on chairs, and said to us, Okay, from this moment on, there are no more kids. You're all adults. You're going to listen. You're going to obey. No back talk. And this is how we grew up overnight. Anyway, I was about 10 and a half years old when the war broke out in Poland. Uh, it was a um, a nice day in September that the whole buildings that we lived in, a three-story building, started to shake and rattle. So I ran to the window to see what was going on, and I saw tanks were rolling down the street. Following the tanks, there were half tracks, and every few steps, a soldier would jump out of the half track, get on the sidewalk, and that's how they occupied the city. There was no fighting. Um, following them were the Wehrmacht with their shiny black boots and their goose steps. It was quite impressionable for a ten and a half year old. As soon as they passed, my father called us into the dining room, set us down on chairs, and said to us, okay, from this moment on, there are no more kids. You're all adults. You're going to listen, you're going to obey, no back talk. And this is how we grew up overnight. Overnight. Now, my father's business was wine and syrup. He had a wine and syrup manufacturing, and he also had a chocolate factory. He was the first one to manufacture chocolate-covered wafers, something like Kit Kat, only they were in the shape of little animals, rabbits, bears, such. It was very interesting. Every day my father comes home, us kids would search his pocket, and he always made sure to have some goodies in there. Anyway... Once the Nazis came in, they my father goes to the wine and syrup business and, and there are guards stationed. They just chase them away, confiscated. He goes to the chocolate factory the same way, confiscated. They chased him away. They wouldn't even let him go and take his briefcase. Every Thing a man was working all his life to build up a little business to feed the family. And just like that, it's taken away. You didn't, couldn't recognize my father when he came home that day. But in Krakow, Poland, new ordinances started to come out against the Jewish people. You know, you had to stay in, in, in the house. There was a curfew from seven to seven. Um, people couldn't, Jewish people couldn't travel anymore. They took away the businesses, don't ask. Um, but on the fifth day of occupation of Krakow, we found out what Nazi brutality was all about. A truck pulled up to the gate where we lived, and a 
pull up soldiers and they started to bang on the gate. Well, the super came running out. What What's going on? All they wanted to know is where the Jewish people lived. And he was quick to oblige. He showed them the lesser family house. And, and there's another young family who lived in the building across the hall. It was a, a husband and a wife. They had two daughters, a little younger than I. And the mother gave birth to an infant little boy about two months earlier. They came breaking down the door, pistol whipping us. We were still in bed. In their hands, they had sex, open sex. And they were yelling, throw in all your valuables, money, gold, silver, anything they can find of value, they threw in. And they're beating up my father to open up his safe, the safe. While my father is trying to open the safe, we hear this terrible screaming in our neighbor's apartment. My sister Lola and I ran out through the kitchen door into their kitchen from the backyard. And this is what we saw when we came in. This monster was holding the infant little boy by its legs and swinging it and yelling to the parents, make him shut up. And the parents, the daughters are screaming, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. With a smirk on his face, you can see he was enjoying what he was doing. He smashes the baby's head into a doorpost, killing it instantly. It's a memory that won't leave me. That screaming baby in the sudden silence of what came out of his head. My God. We jumped on this monster and the other soldiers heard something was going on. They kept, they came in and they pulled us off him. They pistol whipped us. And they were a little shocked themselves because when they saw what happened, they said, okay, Hans, let's go. And they gathered up all their valuables. They collected and they threw it in a sack and threw it in the, in, in the truck. And they, they took off. Can you imagine what it was like? And from that day on, things were starting to get worse. Jewish people had no, well, no businesses. You couldn't travel. You couldn't be go to theaters anymore. We had to wear a Star of David. All of this was happening fast and furious. And you were you were about, like you said, 10, 10 and a half, 11 years old. Seven, that was, yeah, I was almost 11 by then. That was 1938, 1939, somewhere around there. 39, yeah. Okay. I, September of 1939. And uh, anyway... The new law came into Krakow, said the Jewish people may no longer reside in Krakow, but they gave us a choice. If you wanted to live in Krakow, you had to go inside the ghetto. They made the ghetto. And I hope, Ricky, you know what the ghetto is. Yes, I I know what a ghetto is, but for for our listeners, could you could you explain what it's, exactly a ghetto is? Because here in the United States, it means something different. Well, a ghetto is a terrible place. They crowded in into an area and they fenced it around, and and people have to be in one room, like ten or twelve people in a room. 
no beds on the floor, just terrible places. And everyone had to work. Dirty, filthy, disease. Um, oh, everything. Diseases. What? And and everyone. Ben, what did what did those ghettos smell like? Do you remember those smells? What did those ghettos smell like? It smelled pretty bad. <laughs> uh, uh, people, the, the toilets didn't work, so they eliminated themselves wherever they could outside. It was just a terrible place, and everyone had to work. If you didn't work, you didn't get any rations, so you'll die. Uh, and every once in a while, they would have a raid, and they would pull out people and and take him away. Nobody knew where they're taking him or what happened to them. So it was just a terrible place. And uh, But they gave us this choice. Either you go into the ghetto. Most people didn't even know what the ghetto living was like. This was just the beginning. Nobody had... They would, this is the first ghetto they started was in Krakow. My whole father's side of the family went into the ghetto. They were numbering over 200. They went into the ghetto. My father is preparing to go into the ghetto. He's, he's packing. And while he's doing that, the young man walks up to him by the name of Michael G Michael uh, Lieber. And Michael says to my father, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about your daughter, Lola. I love her. Someday I'd love to marry her. But do me a favor, come to the same community that my family is going and I, I'll take care of everything for you, but please come there. My father gave me a choice to go into the ghetto or to go to this community called Nepalomitsa. He went to Nepalomitsa, which was miracle number one. <clears throat> Because all the people who went into the ghetto a few months later were all taken out of the ghetto, put into cattle cars, and taken to Belzec. Belzec was an extermination camp, and everyone from the ghetto was killed. Had my father gone, gone in with us, you know what would have happened to us. So that was a miracle that we went to Nepalomitsa. And Nepalomitsa, well, anyway, my, on the way, uh, we found out that my father had 1,000 American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. He took the money and pasted it into a religious book between the pages. He put it in a sack full of other books that we had. You know, I didn't tell you about my family. We were a family of uh, seven. My father, my mother, I have a picture here I'll show you. Oh, look at that. You see them? Yeah. My sister Goldie, my little brother to leave with my mother, my father, and, and another brother. I have another brother I don't have a picture of. Anyway, out of the seven people in our family, only two of us survived. My sister Lola and I were the only two survivors.
what's it like been or so we've we've we're in 1939 1940 currently yeah what what is it like in 2024 ben for you to hear people deny what happened to you well it it hurts me but i'm used to it by now there are always Holocaust deniers. No, nothing in the world has ever been as documented as the Holocaust. These people know better, but they figure if they tell a lie long enough, some kids will believe it. And that is what bothers me. And this is why I started the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. Zachor means remember in Hebrew. That I I did not know that. I appreciate yeah. you sharing that with me. Um, so there are always probably going to be Holocaust deniers, and that's essentially what I wanted to talk to you for today is to kind of just hear those stories again and, and hear how you – at 96 years old. Yes. You can remember this like it was yesterday. Absolutely. Every every and, and that's why I brought up the smell because people don't people don't think of things like that and a sci or a uh, history class in the 8th grade is really where I started learning the most about World War II and the Holocaust. Yeah. And my teacher, it, it, it was a class project, but we were supposed to um, role play like we were living in ghettos in, in 1938, 1939, 1940. And I I was embarrassed, Ben, because my I, I didn't want to take off my shoes because I had a hole in my sock. And uh. my teacher said, you know, Ricky, that just it makes it more accurate because you know imagine how embarrassed the jewish people were going into those concentration camps and and ghettos imagine the feeling that they had and and ben that changed my life it really did to have somebody explain it to me like that and i took my shoes off and that holy sock i, I was proud of that holy sock that day and for me yeah. to hear people deny, I've seen documentaries, I've seen pictures, I've talked to people like you, Ben, and and for me to to hear the disrespect, the 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 lies that people tell about the Holocaust, and 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 like some people believe that the Holocaust started in 1938, it did not. It started way before 1938. Well, in, in 1938, there was, um, uh, what do you call it? Oh, in Germany, 1938 was the, um, um, forgot the name. Anyway, it'll come back to me. In 1938 in Germany, it started, they were breaking the glass um, windows from Jewish stores and they were uh, looting it and they were uh, killing some of the Jewish people. That started in Germany in 1938. The war. Did your family know about that stuff uh, as it was happening? Yes. Did I know about it? No, I was too young to know. My parents probably knew. But in 1939, the war broke out in September of 39. And it all started all over Europe. Um, anyway, what I was telling you the story when my father... Uh, was now leaving for Nepalam at mid. Uh, we found out he had a thousand American dollars, 
saved up for a rainy day. That was a small fortune in those days. He took the money, pasted it into a, a, a religious book and put it in a sack full of books. And we were loading it on the wagon. We had the horse and buggy driver. And uh, he's taking us to Nepalamitsa. On the way out of Krakow, about an hour out of the city, we're being stopped, halt, and two husky Nazis jump on the wagon. And the first thing they wanted to know, do we have any Jewish literature, books? And they saw two sacks full of books. They picked it up and heaved it on the side of the road. After everybody passed that road, they were going to have a bonfire of all these books. My sister Lola spoke a beautiful German. So she walks up to him and she says, look, my father is a writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book. He looks at her, maybe he liked the way she spoke German. He says, okay, I'll give you five minutes we can find it. The whole family started to climb on the mountain of books. All these books look alike. They're leather bound, black or brown, and they keep sliding off. Anyway, after five minutes, he chased us away, and we didn't find the book. My father is penniless. He's going to a new community. Uh, imagine how he felt. How is he going to? He's got a family of six. We were a family of seven, but my sister Goldie was caught in Munkac, Hungary, when the war broke out. Munkac was, Hungary was a free country. So she was safe with my mother's side of the family, the grandparents and uncles and aunts, they all lived in Munkac, Hungary. So she was okay, but my father had six of members of my family on this wagon, and he doesn't have a penny to his name now. It's not like he can get a job. Jewish people are not allowed to be hired. When he arrived to this house, it was a farmhouse. I I thought I had a picture of it here. Um, no, I don't know where I have it. A farmhouse, a, a little house with a, a sash roof on top of it. Uh, um, the farmer, apple orchard farmer, lived on one side, and the other side was our room. Between the two rooms, there was a baking oven in the hall. People used to bake their own breads. When Michael, my future brother-in-law, heard what happened to my father, he brought my father a sack full of flour, a hundred pounds of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake bread to feed the family. When my father saw the flour, his face lit up. What happened? Instead of baking bread to feed the family, he started to bake pretzels. Why pretzels? All you need for pretzels is flour, water, and salt. And those ingredients he had. Then he took the, neighbor, the pretzels to the neighboring bars and offered it for sale. It was a novelty. They started to buy his pretzels. Now my father became a little baker in that community. I was 12 years old. I remember baking with him. Uh, 
hollies, the twisted um, Jewish breads and cakes and cookies and mandel bread and all kind of goodies. So uh, anyway, that, excuse me. Take your time. I I have a, a full cup of coffee here, so. I know talking, sometimes yeah. talking leads to dry mouth. You're right. So I remember baking with my father. I was uh, 12 years old at the time. Be this lasted for a year, and Lola married Michael, and and they have a beautiful wedding inside the backyard. And these the picture, do you see those people? Wow! Yeah, those, those are the guests for the wedding guests, and. The only survivors from all these people were three of us, Lola, Michael, and and I. This is me. I. That's a good group, a good-looking group of people. Yeah. This is the farmhouse that I, I was going to show you. That's where we moved into Nepal. It's a, into it's this kind of a cool house. What? That's kind of a cool house. Yeah. So anyway, out of all these people, only three of us survived. This little boy is my little brother. He's leaning against my mother. None of them survived. Well... Michael and Lola are now married, and they move into a duplex. The owner of the duplex lived on one side, and Lola and Michael on the other side. The owner was a mayor in Nepalomitsa, in that community. One night he comes home, he says, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. I heard the rumor there is going to be a raid against the Jewish people, either tonight or tomorrow night. When Michael heard that, he went out and he hired the wagon with the driver and we snuck out in the middle of the night. The only place we could go was to a city called Bochnia. Bochnia was the nearest city. Bochnia had a ghetto that meant we had to go inside the ghetto. Bochnia ghetto had a very bad reputation. What happened? Every so often, two or three dump trucks would come into the ghetto and they would go from house to house, pull out the children from their beds and throw them into this dump truck. And after they filled up these two or three dump trucks with children, they started to pull out of the ghetto. The parents were running behind these trucks, screaming for the children. The children are screaming for the parents. But these cultured people had machine guns at the end of each truck. And they would mow down the parents running behind these trucks. No one ever heard from these children again. We can just imagine what they did to them. The driver unloads us on the street, in one street, and it's and, and we are sitting in on a sidewalk. Michael, Lola, and my family, we're all sitting there. When Michael sees his school buddy, 
a guy he went to school with is by the name of Farber. Farber was a Jewish policeman inside the ghetto. They, they had no weapons. All they had was a baton on the side. To, their job was to keep order inside the ghetto. So Farber says, Michael, what are you doing here? And Michael tells him the story about Nepal and Mitzah. He says, Michael, Mr. Lesser, he says, don't worry, I'll find you a place to live. He took Michael, Lola, and his parents and sisters to some place to, to live. And then he took my father, my mother, my little brother, and I, the four of us, I mean, yeah, the four of us, he took us to a room, a big room. In that room, there were eight other people. Now we were there, 12, 12 people. There were no beds. All we had was straw on the ground. On top of the straw, they had blankets. And there were blankets hanging from the ceiling, separating each family. Everybody inside the ghetto had to work. If you didn't work, you didn't receive any rations. My job was working in the uniform factories. I sewed down buttons on uniforms. It was easy work, but it was it was 11 or 12 hours a day. Very little sleep, very little food. And that lasted a year and a half or so. And Farber, that friendly Jewish policeman, goes over to Michael and Lola and says, save yourselves, all of you. There's going to be a raid tonight or tomorrow night. Well, ev ever since those trucks would come in and pull out the children from their beds, every house and every apartment had a hiding place. They called it bunkers. That's when I found out our bunker was, let's see if I have a picture of it. No, I don't have a picture of it here. Was a credenza where you hang your coats and your jackets. You opened up the door, you push the clothing apart, the back panel would slide apart and there was a hole in the wall where the 12 of us could crawl through and get to the other side between two buildings. Lucky for us, the outside of the buildings were connected. Only the roof was open and it was snowing, it was pretty cold. The last person going in had to close the doors behind them, push the closing back in place, close the back panel, and we stood there all night long, freezing, cold, and we heard screams. We heard dogs barking. Dogs were tearing apart our, our neighbors. Shootings, dogs barking, shooting, screaming. Towards morning, it got quiet. When it got quiet, we dared to come out. When we came out, we couldn't believe what our eyes are seeing. People were laying in the snow, torn apart by dogs. I saw a mother and an infant little kid torn apart by dogs. 
and the mother was still breathing. Unbelievable. There were people going around and push carts and picking up these bodies and pieces of bodies and placing them on push carts. Placing them on push carts. See it? Yeah. And they were taking him to the ghetto square and piling them up as high as they could. And these cultured people would come with gasoline cans, pour gasoline over these bodies and start a human bonfire in Bochnia ghetto square. Do I have to tell you what it was like, the stench? the ashes flying, and some of the bodies were still alive and they burned them. Anyway, This was going on. And I knew that Lola and her husband and his family were hiding in a doghouse. You heard the right, a doghouse. You lift up the floor from the doghouse. There was a step ladder down there. You, there was room for seven people and they had food and provisions inside for seven people, bedding and everything. So when you say room for seven people, I just want to clarify, it was probably more like room for like three people, right? Probably, yes. A, a little hole in the doghouse. You can just imagine. Anyway, Michael and Lola are about to go into the doghouse when another Jewish policeman by the name of Morris Schiller walks up with his mother and his sister. And he says, Michael, Lola, I know about your doghouse hiding place. Unless you take my mother and my sister along, I'm going to tell the authorities. Well, there was only room for seven. Now they were nine. Wow. So Michael and Lola decided to walk away to allow the rest of them to go down in the doghouse. And they're walking in the street when this Jewish policeman, the, the friendly one, Farber, sees them. says, Michael, Lola, why aren't you hiding someplace? So he tells him the story about Morris Schiller. He says, Michael, Lola, don't, be, don't worry. I'm going to, where my sister and her two children are hiding, there is room for you. Follow me. They followed them to a leather tannery. Above the tannery, there was a water tank. He says, my sister and her two children are inside that water tank. Climb up the ladder, lower yourself with the rope into the water tank. In the morning when the coast is clear, I'll give you a signal on the tank. When you hear that, you can pull yourself out. Well, Michael is telling the story. They're about, they're lowering themselves, and they see his sister is standing knee deep in water. Her little girl is waist high in water. 
and the mother is holding an infant little boy, yeah, an infant little boy, sleeping, and they were shaking, cold, freezing. Michael picked up the little girl from the floor. Lola took the little baby from the mother, and all of them stood in the water there freezing all night long, and they heard the same thing we heard, shootings, dogs barking, screaming, people being torn apart by dogs. Towards morning, Farber gives the signal, it's time to come out. They pulled themselves out and came down the stepladder after they got a little circulation back into their legs. The first thing they wanted to know is what happened to Michael's family and the doghouse. What happened to Michael's family in the doghouse? Uh -huh. So they went to the doghouse and they found the whole family with a bullet hole in their head shut, laying in the snow. All these pictures have been done by my sister Lola five years after the war from memory. So that that picture is Yeah. It's it's as good as a photograph to me. It's not a photograph. I, I know, it, but to me, to me, it's uh, five years from memory. That's probably exactly what she saw. Yeah. So she started to scream and Michael stopped her. He says, they may still be burning bodies there. You can't, you have to be quiet. So with a quelched cry, they knew what they had to do. You see, according to the Jewish religion, you're supposed to bury your loved ones within 12 or 24 hours, if you can. Michael went out. With Lola and they found a riggedy wheelbarrow. You see the picture? They went out and they put the family on the wheelbarrow. Little Marika, his seven-year-old sister, Lola made her a doll for her, his, her birthday, the seventh year. She's still holding on to the doll. And they're pushing him to the cemetery. So she go to the cemetery. At the cemetery, Michael finds a shovel and he dug out a, a burial site, a hole, you see it? Yes, sir. These are also pictures that Lola made. <laughs> He dug out and put the family into the ground. Then Morris Schiller walks up to them. He says, it wasn't my fault. And it wasn't his fault because his own mother and his sister were also killed. However... However, he says, that grave that you just dug for your parents, for your family, you're going to have to take the family out of the grave. 
take him someplace else. I want that hole for my mother and my sister. Well, Lola started crying. And of course, Michael says, he's got the power over us. And they had to pull everybody out, put him back on the wheelbarrow, take him to another spot, and they dug a fresh hole. While this is going on, they hear a jeep is coming up to the cemetery. And they stop right at the gate. And two husky Nazis jump out of the jeep. They come into the cemetery yelling, Morris Schiller, Morris Schiller. He says, Yavol, here I am, here I am. He walks up to them. They pull out the revolver and they shot him. This is what they did to people who have seen too much. They didn't want to leave any witnesses. They killed him. And they left. And Lola and Michael holding each other, crying. They walked down the hill back to their apartment. People are going around and 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 loudspeakers saying anybody left in the ghetto have to go and register at the Judenrat. If you didn't register, you won't get any rations. You'll die. Well, Ricky, listen, to tell you what happened that my sister Lola, her husband and my father and mother, I and my little brother my and my oldest brother, my oldest brother was, they found out he did forge some papers. He was taken to a concentration camp. And the rest of us, plus 55 people out of the ghetto, we were able to get him out of the ghetto and to freedom. How we did it, I... <laughs> How we did it, you're gonna have to, uh, sorry. Oh, take your time. You're gonna have to read it in the book. I'm, I'm definitely gonna, I, I didn't realize you had wrote a book, man. Oh yeah. Living in lives that matters from Nazi nightmare to American dream. You see it? Yeah, that's okay. that's pretty. That's awesome. I I'm gonna have to get a hold of that book. Okay, I'll tell you something. I'll have a book for you. But what's important is that don't don't buy the book on the internet because they're forgeries. I don't get a nickel out of it if you buy it on the internet. Buy it directly from me on our website, order it, and I'll personalize it for you and sign it. So Ben, in in the description of this show, we're gonna we're gonna leave all that information. We're gonna link that into the description. That way everybody can go to your website and purchase your book. But only from us directly. We will mail it to them and we'll personalize it for them. This book is very, very important. Many, many schools are teaching out of it. I mean, a lot of schools are teaching out of it. I've actually so, got I've actually got a history teacher friend. I'm going to pass that information along to so that she can share that yes. with her class. Yes, it's so important, so important that people read it because 
My whole story is in there and much, much more. I don't have that much time to tell you. Absolutely. And that, that's actually a great point that, <laughs> Ben, you're, you're 96, right? Yes. There's not much time left. And we've got to get this tor story told. We've got to tell everybody. We've got to shout this sh stuff from the rooftops because uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the things going on in Israel right now. Right. I've yeah. watched some very disgusting things come out of my country. Um, I'm not very sure. proud of it. I'm not very proud of the people. It's like education, Ben. It's that simple. Education is very important. And that's why we're seeing all this anti-Semitism popping up in the 2020s. Because some for some reason, we've forgotten. We've forgotten. Forgotten that was... Nothing in the world has ever been as documented as the Holocaust. But these people deny it. And they they know better because no way can you say you don't know. Everybody who has as little brain in his head knows there was a Holocaust. It was documented all over the world. But, but yet they deny it because on the internet, it's so easy to deny it to hundreds or thousands of people who don't know better. Youngsters don't know better. And they start to believe this is how they grow up, anti-Semites. So anyway... As I was saying, we were outside the ghetto now, 55 plus my family. My oldest brother was arrested because he was forging some documents. Outside the ghetto, Michael befriends a truck driver who was hauling coal. And he asked him to if he could convert his truck into a double decker so that we can hide people between the coal and the chassis. And we paid him a lot of money. He agreed and he converted his truck into a double decker. You see me all right, then, don't you? Yeah, I see you good, Ben. Okay. He converted the truck. And the truck would hold 10 people between the chassis and the, and the coal. So I remember the first group of people was 10. And Michael and Lola went first. With, the, with eight others. Why did they go first? Because he couldn't always believe these truck drivers. They would take your money up front, and if they turn you into the SS or the Gestapo, they get, they get paid again. ransom money. They get paid ransom money. So they went first. And we made up a password between us. When the driver comes back with the right password, that means you can trust him. Anyway, two days later, he came back with the right password. So there was room for another 10 people. My father and mother insisted that I and my little brother, Tuli, go with a group of eight and my father and mother were supposed to go to the next transport. Anyway, I remember getting in this truck like sardines. I laid on the side of my top of my arm facing my little brother. We, we were like sardines. 
but it had to be done. And we went out about an hour outside, outside of the city of, of Bochnia. We're being stopped. And we see through the cracks of the truck, we see soldiers with rifles. We figured, okay, somebody turned us in. They're going to kill us. And they talked to the driver. And then the truck started to move again. And we felt, oh, they're letting us go. But after a few minutes, we see on the step by the, by the driver's side, there's a soldier with a rifle. And now there are soldiers on top of the truck on the coal and walking around. And the coal dust is filtering right through. My little brother is about to sneeze. I'm holding his nose and his mouth. This, they were with us for an hour. And we figured when the truck stopped, this is it. They're going to kill us now. All we heard is Danke schön, Danke schön. They were just hitchhiking. Imagine, talk about miracles. Ten Jewish people under their feet for two hours. They had no idea. They were just hitchhiking. Two hours later, we arrived at the forest. It was already nighttime. And he tells us to get out of the truck. And he unloaded this coal there and everything. And and we, we went into the forest, he says, up the hill. 300 yards from here, there is a tool shed. Inside the tool shed, there is a forest ranger who happened to be a smuggler. He's waiting for you. Sure enough, we walked up there and, and there was the forest ranger waiting for us. He took us in the middle of the forest he made us lay down on our stomach and he says to us, look up. We look up and we see soldiers are walking back and forth with their dogs. Soldiers with rifles and the dogs. That was the border of Czechoslovakia and Poland. We had to cross Czechoslovakia and then cross another border from Czechoslovakia to Hungary. So we had two borders to cross. The first border, three o'clock, we see the, the, the guards were coming down the hill with their dogs. And after they were out of our sight, quietly we shimmied our way up to the top and the smuggler picks up the barbed wire. He says, if you cross on the other side of this barbed wire, there's a big ravine, you're going to fall. So be sure you sit down at the end of the mountain, hold hands, and slide down quietly. If you tumble, it's all over. They're going to hear you and they're going to kill you. Sure enough, we sat down on the other side, holding hands, and we slid down this mountain. And suddenly we heard, we, we hit a plateau. I asked my little brother, are you okay? He says, yes, he's okay. When somebody taps me in my shoulder, I jump out of my skin. Who in the middle of nowhere is, and he says, Bainish. Now, nobody called me Bainish except my immediate family. He says, I'm your uncle Belo, your mother's brother. 
How did you, how did you find me here in the middle of nowhere? He says, when Lola and Michael came around two days earlier, they contacted us, and I came out here to meet you. So we were very happy, and we came down the hill. Another story, but you have to tell you the story, how we had to cross the other border to Hungary it's too long. I, I know I don't, I'm getting too tired. I can't talk. I, I, that's okay, Big. I'm going to get your book and read your book because I, I, I didn't realize that you had written a book. And I'm so intrigued by this story because it's – so, Ben, you, you were born in Krakow. And Rick, as you're – Ricky, Ricky, listen to me. You're intrigued by my story. My story is just beginning. Yeah. So and your story that, isn't is isn't unique. There's lots of people out there with that, that story. And and I let me tell you what happened next. The Nazis, well, for a few months it was freedom. And people were going to proms, to weddings, and in Hungary, nobody believed what I was telling them. They said, well, Hungary is an ally of Germany. Uh, we are not afraid the Nazis coming in here. But I'm waiting for my father and mother to come with the next load on, the, on that kettle, on that cold truck. Never arrived. Somebody came across the border who knew my parents and they knew what happened to them. He was telling us they were walking into the truck. You see this? Yeah. As they were walking in the truck, a Polish farmer in one of those houses saw what was going on. They called the Gestapo. They came, they pulled everybody out of the truck and they lined them up against the wall, including the driver who was Polish Gentile. All 11 people were shot. All 11 people were shot. So now I knew why my parents didn't make it. And now the Nazis came into Hungary like they were invited guests. When they came in, they knew every Jewish person where they lived their, their businesses, their education, they knew everything. How come they didn't have computers in those days? IBM had punch cards and they would sell their, this information, these punch cards to anyone who would pay the price. IBM doesn't deny it. But they said they had no idea for what purpose they're going to use it. So now they were right away. They made ghettos and they 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 knew everything. To they took away our businesses and everything. Within two months' time, they were now shuttling. Jews to the death camps from Hungary. This is what they told us. Germany needs workers. Every able-bodied man and woman will be working in Germany. The older people will be cared for Children will be schooled. 
bring along all your valuables that you can carry with you, but leave everything else behind. And if you're going to be hiding, you're going to be killed immediately. Well, the Jewish people in Hungary believed it because nobody knew about death camps. I didn't know it either, even though I was from Poland. Maybe my parents knew, but I was too young. They didn't tell us those things. So they load us into cattle cars, 82 cattle car. While we're waiting to get into the cattle car, I see two men on a stretcher with a woman on top of it, and they come and they set it down by my feet. I take a good look, a bloodied woman. I said, it's my sister, Goldie. I say, Goldie, what happened to you? She says she tried to escape. She went as far as the railroad station. A Hungarian gendarme who went to school with her recognized her. He turned her into the SS. They beat her to pulp. Now they're ordering, ordering us to get inside the cattle car. 82 cattle car wouldn't be so bad if it were not for, for all the bundles that everybody had a bundle with them. It got so tight that if you wanted to sit down, someone else had to stand up. They had two buckets of water inside the tank, inside the cattle car. Once the water was gone, there were no sanitary facilities, no toilets. 80 people, imagine, one day, two days, three days. Can you imagine what it was like? We start, they, they started to use the buckets and pretty soon those buckets were overflowing. It was so bad <laughs> that you couldn't sit on the ground. Now we were happy we had bundles. We can sit on top of the bundles. After three days on the third night, he arrives at a place called Oshwinchim. Oshwinchim was Polish for Auschwitz. I don't know about the Auschwitz team. I don't know about the Auschwitz. And the train pulls in to a gated, you see the gate on top of the gate, it says, Arbeit macht frei, labor gives you freedom. Those were the gates of Auschwitz. But we don't know any of this. The train stayed, stood there for two hours and then started to go pull out of the gate and it went another three kilometers and it stopped. <coughs> this place was called Birkenau. Birkenau was part of Auschwitz. Birkenau was where most of the killing was done. We arrived to Birkenau, the doors open up, and they're yelling at the different languages and talks that are, are barking. Leave all your belongings where it is. Don't you pick anything up. Women and children to the right, a man to the left. Now, I was 15 and a half years old. I could have gone as a child with my sister and my little brother, but I decided to go with my uncle and my cousin as an adult. Why? I was figuring if this is a labor camp, 
They want you to labor. And if you labor, they're going to feed you better. That's the only reason. But that was miracle two. Actually, miracle three already. Had I gone with my little brother and my sister, they went straight to the gas chambers. This was a strange place. It was nighttime. You see, ashes are flying just like snow. And every time you make a step, you leave the footprint like just like in snow. A funny smell, and we see four different chimneys and flames are shooting out of them. The men ahead of me are saying, oh, those must be smelting factories. This is probably where we will be working. Who knew? Those were the ashes of our dear departed ones. Those were people. Burning man. people. That was Birkenau. To hear you tell this story, I, I, uh, I'm seeing all, my imagination. Yes, I'm, yes. I'm seeing it. Uh, you described the the coal truck. The picture you showed me exact it was exactly what I was picturing in my head. You're really, really. you are doing okay. a fantastic job. So, so Rick, listen. I am staying on the platform there and we're walking forward, forward, and we see a doctor. And with the white glove, and he's going right, left, right, left, right, left. Every once in a while, he would ask somebody a question. When I came close enough, I heard him ask a young man, comes to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers, or would you rather go by truck? This young man says he had a bad knee, he would rather go by truck. He sent him to the right. To the right meant that. But who knew? I didn't know that. Nobody knew. That doctor with his white glove sending people right and left was Dr. Mengele. Did you hear of him? Yes. Dr. Mengele was the angel of death. He decided we should live, we should die with a flick of a finger. And <clears throat> I came close to him. I spoke German, so I tell my uncle, my cousin, let me go first. But whatever he asks you, Tell him you can work, you can run, you're healthy. And I go first. Remember, I'm 15 and a half. I stretch myself out in front of him. I saluted him. Before he even asked me a question, I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm 18 years old. I'm healthy and I can work. So he asked me, comes to few kilometers loud, can you run five kilometers? I said, yeah, well, he sent me to the left. My uncle and cousin followed. They lead us to a big auditorium. <laughs> what I didn't tell you is in Hungary, in Munkaj, I told my uncle, who was a very wealthy man, I says, uncle, if the Nazis ever come in here, they're going to take everything away, your store, your everything, your money. It would make sense if you can convert all your valuables into diamonds so we could hide it on our body. 
he listened to me. One day he came home with boxes full of shoes, a pair of shoes for every member of the family. He tells us, knows that the heel of these shoes, there are diamonds. Use it only in a life-threatening situation. And he gave every member of the family a pair of these beautiful black shoes. And I was wearing my black shoes. So was my uncle and his son, my cousin. And they were ordering us to get undressed and get out of your shoes and walk over to the line of barbers. They cut your hair and all over and then go into the showers. Well, my uncle, my cousin got out of their shoes. We were ordered to, but I hated to part with my diamonds. So picture this, I am naked, beautiful black shoes on, and I walk up to these barbers, they cut my hair all over my body. They weren't exactly gentle the way they cut it. And the guards are going up back and forth and looking at us. It's like God blinded him. He didn't see my shoes. Had he seen it, he would have killed me. I disobeyed an order. And they sent me to go into the showers. So I go in with my shoes. And there they gave me striped clothes after we showered. And they gave us uh, shoes, a pair of shoes, wooden shoes, wooden soles and canvas on top. I got into those shoes and I put my beautiful shoes under my arm, under my jacket, and they walk us out to the barracks. When we arrive at the barrack, the student Meltester, the man in charge of the barrack, comes out and he speaks to us in a broken German. And I can tell that he was from a Polish inmate. So this is what he says to us. Ha! Huh. You Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes, those flames? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you told, this is how you're going to wind up ashes. I couldn't believe it. My sister, my little brother, ashes. And they chase us in the barrack. And we took a top bunk and we laid down and both of us, all three of us, fell asleep. We were so tired, we fell asleep. About an hour later, my cousin wakes me up. Get up, get up, Benny. Kicks me. I says, what? He says, listen. And I hear it chanting, a crying, a singing, or laughing. I can't make it out. Then he says, look, there was a board missing on one side of the barrack, and we see a flame shooting flame. He says, what is this? I, I said, I don't know, but I'll find out. And I went to the Stuben Meltester, to this man in charge, and I spoke to him in Polish, the Russian part in Polish. When he hears me speaking Polish, he was so happy to see somebody speak his language that he couldn't stop telling me what's going on in Auschwitz. I said, what do I hear? He says, what you hear is people being thrown into a fiery pit, and those are their screams. The fiery pit is one barrack away from you. And this is what we hear day and night. 
screams they're throwing in people. And, and he couldn't stop telling me stories. And he was telling me how long it takes to kill a person inside the gas chambers. He says, it's a half hour. But they couldn't wait a half an hour to wait till you're dead. After 15 minutes, they opened up the gas chambers let it air out for 15 minutes and they put the thunder commando in there they pulled out everybody they cut their hair they pulled out their gold teeth and checked the orifices on the body and then they put them on a gurney five or ten on a gurney with a rope on it on the track, sending it to the crematorium. But this was too slow of a process now because the trains were coming in full of people. So now they had trucks and they were throwing these bodies, half dead bodies, into these trucks. And the children, you know, when they pushed you in to the gas chamber, the mother were holding their children. They pulled those children away from the mothers because they didn't want the child to take up space. They told the mother to lift up her arm. They pushed her in. This way they can put in more people. Those children were put on top of the these half dead bodies on the truck and they were taking him to the to the fiery pits and they were throwing in these children alive and these other half dead people alive into the fiery pits. I made a mistake. I didn't believe what he was telling me. So it was still nighttime. So I went out of my barrack and snuck up to the next barrack to see if it's true what he's saying. And I, I couldn't believe it. There was a truck full of people and they were picking up children alive, screaming and throwing them into these fiery pits. Imagine, that's when I asked, where is God? There is no God. How can you watch this? I can't and even imagine the feeling that you had. Oh, my God. It, I, I made a mistake. Not knowing whether you're seeing is real. Because I saw it really what happened. And we were in Auschwitz for two weeks to tell you what we went through daily is unbelievable. I survived it. We had to go out every morning naked to be counted. And the SS would go around and look at each body if you look too skinny to them, they would pull you out and send you to the gas chambers. Imagine having a selection like this every morning, not knowing what happened to you next. After two weeks, they put us in trucks and they took us to labor camp called Dernhau. Dernhau was a rock quarry. As they dynamited the mountain and boulders were coming down, it was our job with sledgehammers to break these boulders into manageable pieces and throw it into mining carts 
run it down the tracks to grinding machines where they made gravel out of it and push them back up. It was back-breaking work. And I figured my uncle is never going to survive this. So I bribed the kitchen chef with my diamonds to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. He took my diamonds and he gave my uncle a job in the kitchen. It got easier for us because my uncle could eat in the kitchen. He couldn't carry, take anything out. They were search. But he, he can... Every day when we came home from work, we had to line up in rows of five. They counted us, and then they would dismiss us. We would go for our rations and go to our barrack. This one day we come back from work, and they count us, and they count us, and they count us. They won't dismiss us. And the commandant comes down with his Freulein and he says, I'm going to show the Schweinhund the lesson they'll never forget. What happened? Three inmates escaped. And because of this, he orders his henchmen to pull out every tenth person in line to receive 25 lashes. Well, as they're counting every 10th person in line, I can see my uncle who is in front of me is going to be a 10. So I push him behind me and I took his place. They took all of us number 10 in the middle of the yard. They brought down uh, bundles of it, uh, stakes, uh, one by one inch, about two and a half feet long. And they brought down a sawhorse. Do you know what a sawhorse is? Yeah. All right. It's like a tripod. And, and this is what they order us to do. Stand in front of the sawhorse, tiptoe. Bend over, but your stomach cannot touch the two by four. One man is pulling your trousers real tight, and the other one starts to hit. And you have to count out loud. If you miscount, you start from one again. If your stomach touches the two by four, you start from one again. If your heel touches the ground, you start from one again. Anyway, I was number four. There were three men ahead of me. The first one goes up to this uh, sawhorse, tiptoes, bend over, and they start to... One man is pulling his trousers and the other man starts to hit and he starts to yell out, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Every time they hit him, you can see a, a, a line of blood coming through the trousers. These one by one inch stakes were so hard. They were tearing you apart. Anyway, this guy miscounted and he touches the floor with his heel. He touches the two by four again and again. They start all over again so many times and he falls. The minute he falls, the commandant goes over, kicks him in the face. And he says, get up. He couldn't. He pulls out a revolver and he shoots him right at the temple. His girlfriend, this Fräulein, walks over to him, gives him a hug and a kiss, like he just performed a heroic act. He killed a man. Number two. By the way, when he shot him, 
his Freulein, his girlfriend, gives him a hug and a kiss. Number two goes up. The same way, he couldn't do it. He touches the floor. He touches the two by four. He miscounted it again and again. And finally, he falls. When he falls, the commandant goes over, kicks him in the face, get up. He couldn't. He shoots him right in the temple. So we have ten dead body, two dead bodies. And now number three goes up. Number three was a little younger, but he too miscounted. He touches with the stomach, touches the floor. Anyway, started again and again. He falls. He starts to yell out, please have mercy on me, don't kill me. And the commandant says, then stand up, come over here and face me. The poor guy stands up, makes four steps, and he falls. The minute he falls, the commandant goes over, kicks him in the face. He couldn't get up, shoots him right in the temple. So now we have three dead bodies ahead of me, and Ben Lesser is next in line. What can I tell you? How were you feeling in that moment where you're next in line? What were you feeling? I can't, I can't describe that feeling. I walk up there and I said to myself, I bent over that, that sawhorse. I says, Ben, this is it. If you want to live another five minutes, you better do exactly what you told or else you're dead. So I psyched myself out and I tiptoe. I bend over the two by four without touching my stomach, not touch it. One man is pulling my trousers real tight and the other one starts to hit, and I yell out, Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Finally, zwanzig, einundzwanzig, zweiundzwanzig, dreiundzwanzig, vierundzwanzig, fünfundzwanzig, twenty-five, I made it. You can hear a pin drop in that camp. No one believed anyone could survive this. The man who was pulling my trousers tight says to me in Yiddish, go over and thank the commandant. So I stand up, I walk over, blood is running down my legs. I salute him and I say, Danke schön, Herr Commandant. Thank you, Herr Commandant. When he hears that, he puts his hand on my shirt collar, twists me around facing the number 10s who are still to be beaten. He says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this, Junge, you have nothing to worry about. While this is going on, there is a commotion at the gate. They caught those three inmates and they were pulling them in. Bloody, you couldn't recognize any of them. The commandant saw that, just like a child gets sick of a toy and throws it away. He tells all of us, number 10, to go back to our original line. And he orders his henchmen to bring down a portable gallow. And we had to watch. If you dare to close your eyes, you got whipped. While they were hanging, each one individually. 
I remember the last one was a little younger. They put the noose around his neck. He yelled out, Shema Yisrael. Anyway, it's a, it's a Hebrew prayer before you die. Only six letters, six words rather, six words. They wouldn't let him complete the six words. They were such, say this. And then they dismissed us like nothing ever happened. We go for our rations. And I tell you, for weeks, I could not sleep on my back. I had to sleep on my stomach. My back was full of welts. I don't know how I survived this. God was with me. And I felt God was leading me to survive. No one believed anyone could survive this. A few weeks later, we hear cannon fire at night. And when we report to go to work, there is this loudspeaker saying, no one is working today. The camp is being evacuated. Line up in rows of five and march out of the camp. That was called the death march because if you could not keep up pace with the soldiers, they shot you. And all day long, you heard pop, pop, pop. And I am with my cousin. My uncle was already in the kitchen. We couldn't say goodbye to him. We never saw him again. We don't know what happened to them. Well, we're marching. In my book, you're going to see where I wrote that I marched three or four weeks. You know, days and night didn't mean anything to us anymore. We were like zombies just walking. Recently, I had a phone call from a German professor in Germany. And he asked permission to translate my book. He read it. He liked it. He wanted to translate it in German. He gave him permission. And he's, he said he read my book and he loved it so much. But he said, Mr. Lesser made two mistakes. What are they? I say in my books that I marched on the dead march two or three or four weeks. He says, Mr. Lesser marched seven weeks, 460 kilometers from Dernau to Buchenwald. And he knows. There was another mistake, but I'll tell you about that later. Anyway, in Buchenwald, they sent us to a barrack. They fed us and we showered. They gave us fresh clothes, fresh shoes, because the last week I, that of the march, my shoes fell apart. And I was now marching barefooted in snow for a whole week. To this day, I have trouble with my bottom of my feet. Anyway, next morning, we had to be counted again, and, and we had to walk out. And they lined us up. They, they marched us out of the camp. About 300 yards, we saw cattle cars waiting for us. They lined us up, 82 cattle car, and I pushed in my cousin into the cattle car, and I told him, find this spot against the wall where we can rest our back. I remember going to Auschwitz, and there were people all around me. 
it was terrible. And he did. He found a good spot. He saved a good spot for me. We were now against the wall. And we waited. They closed the gate. Two hours later, they opened it up. And they threw in 80 loaves of bread. A loaf of bread for each person. Picture this. Those people who were next to the door were grabbing three or four or five breads. Those of us against the wall had nothing. We don't know where we're going for how long. We had to get a bread. My cousin was too weak, but I started to climb over the sitting inmates to get to the door to wrestle out the bread from somebody who had many. One inmate that I crawled over his head, he didn't like it. He had to have a pocket knife and he stabs me. And I feel a stab. My blood, my mouth is filling up full of blood. But I have to get a bread. I can't stop. So I keep going. And this guy had about five breads. I pulled one away and he kicked me. I put it in my pocket and I got, I went back to my cousin and he says, Ben, what's happening to you? You're bleeding. I put my finger here and it went right through my tongue. I had such a big gash full of blood. That's another miracle. And all the smuts and dirt, I took a piece of my trousers and made a bandage on me. Can you imagine this bread? I had it in my back pocket and I rationed it out between my cousin and myself at midnight, every midnight, we'll have a piece of bread the size of a half an egg. I gave him a half and I ate half. For two weeks, the bread lasted in my pocket. And after two weeks, there was no more left. And we're still shuttling. The train is going back and forth for another week. And we arrived at a place called Dachau. Dachau, they opened up the cattle car where we're in, and they say anyone who can walk out, walk out through the tracks and go into that gate of Dachau. Well, out of the 80 in my cattle car, there were 80 people only four of us walked out alive. The rest of them were all dead. Everybody was dead. My cousin and I and two other men walked out alive. And we were so hungry and so thirsty. In the tracks of the train, there was a little water from the night before it was raining. As soon as they told us to get out, I remember dropping on that track and licking the water. My God, they saw us. They, they, they beat us up and told us to go in. We came in, Dachau, we saw a mountain full of dead bodies. You see it? Yes. Apparently, they ran out of coal to burn, burn the bodies, so they piled them up as high as they could. And they put me and my cousin in a barrack right next to these bodies. And on the floor, they pushed me to the wall. 
some of the inmates felt sorry for us and they gave us a little water to drink. It was terrible. No food, nothing. We just lay there, remember. When two days later, I hear, Bafrayan, Bafrayan, the Americans, liberation, liberation, Americans. I heard that. I tell my cousin, let's go out and see what's going on here. And holding each other, we, we shuffle out and we see inmates are crawling on their hands and knees and kissing the boots of the American GI. They look like gods to us. They liberated us. And these GIs, soldiers, you can see, they were shocked. They were shocked what they saw. Anyway, I tell my cousin, let's go out and be, be shuffle our bay out and two GIs walk up to us. One of them had a can of Spam. He opens up the can of Spam. It smelled so good. We made a mistake. We ate some of it. And both of us came down with dysentery. My cousin dies in my arm, the night of liberation. And I talked to him, and I talked to him. I won't let him go. But they saw that. So they came, they pulled him away from me. I followed, where are you taking him? And my knees gave out from under me, and I fall. The minute I fell, they pushed me to a wall. And I was there for about two hours. One man walks up to me, nicely dressed, and he says to me in a broken German, how many languages do I talk, do I know? So I told him the languages, and he says, Polish? I'm a Polish Jesuit priest. I came here with doctors and nuns from Paris, and we were opening up a field hospital in the yard of Dachau. And I'm going to take you there, he says to me. He picked me up like a sack of bone, which I was. I don't think I want, I weighed more than 40 or 50 pounds. I was 16 and a half years old at the time. And he carries me to the infirmary. The nun comes out of the infirmary. They lay me on a cot with a white sheet on it. And she takes my vitals and I pass out. I pass out five weeks later, five weeks later, I woke up in a monastery in Santertillion, a monastery in Bavaria. That's where I was born. I just woke up there from my, practically I was dead, but and when the nun saw me open my eyes, she started to yell for the other nuns to come in. They all came in to see me, I'm alive. Anyway, to continue with my story, we'll take another hour or two. I'm a you wanna, uh, Hey, Ben, I know you had said about an hour ago that you're getting kind of tired. Would yeah. you like to continue this a different day or? No, I, uh, this is the end of the, li you're liberated, right? Yeah. My life after liberation 
read it in the book. I mean, it's a beautiful story. How out of two and a half billion people in the world, I wind up with my sister in the same room about two feet apart and neither one of us knows the other survived. And I walk away to go to Israel, Palestine. Anyway, it's it's unbelievable story. Uh, and, and how coming to America, what I had to go through to make a beautiful life for myself and my family. I got married and I, let's see if I have a picture here. Uh, I thought I did. While you're looking for that picture, I'm just going to tell you, I love your office, Ben. You do? I do. It's so, it, it's really, really nice. I love it. I know. That picture you see there? Yes. Has a whole story in itself. <laughs> so I don't see where it is. Here it is. Look my at that. Marriage, my marriage, 72 years we were married. My wife passed away two years ago. 72 years. Most of what well, I would say the best marriage I know of. I don't ever remember having a quarrel with my wife. And she was so supportive supportive of me anything i decided to do she went along with it so you know the rest of it i'll let, leave to you to read my book thank you very much ben i can't we had some technical difficulties just a little while ago and uh and at 96 years old i don't You've got the patience of a saint. I, I that no, was no. very frustrating for me to 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 be able. I'm like, man, I'm 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 trying to hold on here, trying to hold my stuff together, and 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 you just the the experiences that you've went through your whole life. You know, it's it's like, oh, you know, a computer glitch, not a big deal. We can handle this, and I really appreciate you hanging out with me and telling your story. You, you know, you're going to read my book where I was actually on Skid Row on Main Street in Los Angeles, Skid Row in a hotel for a dollar a night. And after I ran out of money, I couldn't pay the dollar a night. I had no more money to for a cup of coffee. And how I came out of all of this and I made a beautiful life for myself. That's something you have to know. I worked uh, 24, well, I worked for 25 years for, um, for package company, um, what's called, um, but UPS? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-five years for UPS. And after twenty-five years, I was only about fifty-nine or sixty. I said that's enough. And I went into real estate. And eventually I became a broker. And eventually I I had two offices and I had 70 agents working for me. Wow. 70. And eventually I became very prominent and they made me president of the West Side Beverly Hills Real Estate Brokers Association. I, I, I have quite a story to tell. And then what happened is uh, 
Carter became president and interest rate jumped to 20 or 21%. Nobody could buy a house. And I had 70 some odd agents and they were all starving. And most offices are closing up. And how I got out of this, my God, barely, barely gotten out of it. Uh, but anyway, and I traveled the world with my wife all over. You're going to find out in the book. I'm going to, as soon as I get off uh, of this recording here with you, Ben, I'm, I'm going to go to your website and I'm going to order your book because I just... You know my the, website. Yeah, this is very... You do have an incredible story, not just the trials and tribulations that you've been through, you know, pre-1947, but, you know, the, the war ended in 45 and it didn't stop there for you. You moved to the United oh. States in, in 47 yeah. and then uh, it, your time on Skid Row. I, You know, Ben, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't even know Skid Row was a real place. You know, that's how much we pay attention to history here. Yeah. So, um and and I, like like I said before, you'd mentioned that you had gotten tired, and and I don't want to keep you too long, but I want to ask you: Do you still have a tattoo? They didn't give me a tattoo when I came into uh, with the Hungarian crowd. They were so um, they didn't have time for tattooing, and they stopped. They gave me a number. You see my number? Did you hang that around your neck? Yeah, 41212. That, that was my number. You see it? Yes. Living a Life That Matters by Ben Lesser. Ben, this has been an incredible conversation, and I'm going to communicate with Cindy, and uh, if, if we could schedule something in, uh, later, if you'd like to, we'll Great. write. Thank you. Thank you for telling me your story, Ben. And like I said, I'll coordinate with Cindy. And, and thank you. Thank you very much for hanging out with me and through all the, the technical glitches and stuff. And I can't thank you enough. Here, bye. You too. Bye, Ben. Thank